uh, he and David are terrific partners in these things. And, and Steve and I were talking a while ago. You know, you now have, uh, with David Young, with Rod Bloom, and with Steve, we've come a long way by the time you pick up two Senate seats, you now have three House seats, and, of course, you have the longest serving, I think this December, the longest serving governor in the history of the United States, uh, which is amazing. I knew Cherry when he was only the longest serving governor in the history of Iowa. Uh, and he just keeps going out and doing stuff and working away at it, and he's a remarkable person. So, Chris and I are both delighted to be here. And I have to give one very brief commercial because we'll be back this fall with her fifth Ellis the Elephant book. I'm very proud of the fact that she's taken on American history for 48-year-olds and teaching them history in a way that they can learn it and they can hear it. And we'll be back next time. probably different than almost all the folks who are going to speak to you today. I agreed to come here when Dave and Steve asked me to because I knew that you all would be here, that a lot of potential candidates would be here, and therefore the media would be here. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to come to talk about something that I think is extraordinarily serious and not political in any normal sense. It's about America's survival. And I want to say to you flatly that almost 14 years after 9-11, the United States today is losing the war with radical Islamists. And we have to have the courage to confront how badly we are doing in this war. And not just as an anti-Obama comment. The State Department was about equally bad, frankly, under George W. Bush. The unwillingness to tell the truth about who our enemies are was equally bad after the first year because gradually all of these so-called experts kept saying, oh, you can't really tell the truth about who they are because that might confuse other people. And so why don't you make up strange terms? And, you know, it became bizarre. You see, you see people all around the planet. This is a global war. And yet they insist on talking about it by geography. So we're going to really focus on northern Syria. Well, there are thousands of jihadists who have come to northern Syria from all around the world. Over a thousand from France alone. So over 600 from Great Britain. Over 100 from the United States. This is a global war. In Nigeria, Boko Haram has 10,000 fighters. And last year, Boko Haram killed more people than Ebola. But the State Department for years under Secretary Clinton wouldn't even list them as a terrorist group. Even though their initial base camp was called Afghanistan in honor of the Taliban. Now you would think somewhere in here people get a hint. You know, I look around the planet at suicide bombings, I look at beheadings, I look at all these different things going on. They don't strike me as a Rotary Club conspiracy. Or, you know, the Kiwanians running amok. There is one common pattern occurring everywhere across the planet, and that is radical Islamists who hate our civilization, are prepared to cut off our heads, and are determined to impose their religion. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about President Obama's pathological incapacity to deal with reality. Because I think, I think that's what it is. I mean, I, there's, there's, there's no point in trying to get him to learn uh, how to say the words radical Islamist because he has a speech impediment which blocks him from being able to say the words. I mean, he just, you know, it would be embarrassing. Watching John Kerry the other day try to explain all this. It's not about religion. It's about specific, unique, random individuals. So you end up at Fort Hood with somebody who's carrying a card that says Soldier of Allah, somebody who we now know was on the internet talking to an American uh, imam in Yemen, who we later on killed with a predator. Uh, somebody who jumps up, yells Allahu Akbar, and kills 13 Americans. And even the institution of the US Army is so corrupted by the intellectual dishonesty we now live with, they described it as a workplace incident. Yeah. Yeah. 
this is as though in 1946 and 1947 and 1948 we'd had Henry Wallace instead of Harry Truman, and we'd had a president who said, you know, there is no KGB, there is no common term, the Soviet Union is not a threat, communism's okay, I don't think you should be worried about all these things. And that's where we are. We have an elite, frankly, in both parties, unwilling to tell the truth. You're not going to win this war if you can't tell the truth. You're not going to win this war if you can't admit it's a war. Now, let me be very clear, because I can already hear some of our friends on the left, and a few of our friends on the right, who want to th think Gingrich wants us to have an army of 7 million and occupy everywhere. Baloney. This is a campaign that should be fought with the largest possible number of allies. It's a campaign which should be fought wherever possible by surgically and methodically hunting down people. And, and we can draw a clear distinction. If you are Muslim and you are willing to live in peace with your neighbors and you have no problem with people converting in both directions and you'd like to be allowed to have a mosque, but by the way, they can have a synagogue or a temple or a church. I have no problem with, with Muslims who are prepared to live in diversity. But if you are a Muslim who believes you're going to impose Sharia by cutting off my head, I have a desire to kill you before you cut off my head. President George W. Bush's magnificent speech to the joint session of Congress shortly after 9-11. There he said, there's an axis of evil. And he listed Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. Now, he could have added a few more countries. I mean, several of them felt hurt that they weren't on the list. But it was a good start. And there, that's the speech in which he said, you're either for us, or you're against us. But the State Department and others promptly began saying, well, you can't really mean that. I mean, you're really prepared to go to the Saudis and say to them, you're either for us or you're against us, and cut off all of their funding for all the different elements that preach Sharia? Are you really prepared to take on the argument about Sharia? Now, you have a new leader in Egypt who is remarkably like <coughs> who is remarkably like Saddam. That is, he's a military leader dominating a country by force because the alternative is a Muslim Brotherhood radicalized Egypt threatening to the United States and the entire world. Now, I will tell you flatly, while I would love to see the Egyptian people be prosperous and free and have a chance to live in a genuine democracy, I am not, just as I was not confused by communists, who were very eager to have one vote one time in Italy and France. I am not confused by the Muslim Brotherhood, which would like to use our language to impose their way of life and never again have an election once they're in charge. So I think we've got to recognize this is as intellectually significant a fight as the development of anti-communism was between 1945 and 1950. Ronald Reagan was a Democrat. He had voted for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He actually, in 1948, did a commercial for Harry Truman and did a commercial uh, for Hubert Humphrey. But Hubert Humphrey, in 1948, was the anti-communist liberal taking on the communist wing of the Democratic Farm and Labor Party. But Reagan, in 47, when he was active, he became president of the Screen Actors Guild. And one night in 1947, he's sitting around chatting with a guy. And this guy says to him, you know, I am a genuine Stalinist. And when we win, you are the kind of person we're either going to put in jail or we're going to kill. And Reagan went home and he thought to himself, gee, I wonder what that guy meant. <laughs> <laughs> and being a, a relatively simple person, I mean, not, not somebody who had been to Harvard Law School and been thoroughly educated in how to avoid reality. <laughs> Reagan said to himself, gosh, 
I guess he meant if he wins, they will either put me in jail or kill me. And then Reagan, in a totally selfish, narrow attitude, decided he didn't want them to win. And it was just one of those acts that proved that Reagan was becoming a right winner because he was prepared for the Soviet Union to be defeated. Now, it took, from that moment of awareness in 1947, 44 years for the Soviet Union to collapse. And frankly, I thought it would take another 20 or 30. But we calmly and methodically built a worldwide coalition. We calmly and methodically built the most powerful military in history. We calmly and methodically actually spied on people. We actually went out and did the things necessary to be safe. We had a clear notion that we were prepared to defend America and America's allies. And we did it for 44 years. I am here today. I'm here today to ask you to talk to your members of Congress and to send whatever device you use, Twitter, Facebook, email, telephone, snail mail, personal visit, to friends around the country. I wrote a piece the other day in the Wall Street Journal, which I outlined, and you can see it if you go to GingrichProductions.com. Um, I outlined the hearings the U.S. Congress should have. In my mind, intellectually, I've written off this administration. It's hopeless, and frankly, unless there's some great conversion experience by Hillary Clinton, I would write her off. I think she is part, she is part of this worldview. She is with Obama. She can't hide from it. It is a fact. in getting the Congress to understand, both in the House and the Senate, that we need probably six months or more of hearings. We need hearings that start at the beginning. Why are they radical Islamists? What are their values? What's the world they seek to accomplish? And, and don't kid yourself. This is a very pervasive problem. There's a blogger in Saudi Arabia who was for liberalizing Saudi Arabia. He has been sentenced to 1,000 lashes delivered in public, 10 per week. Now, the United States government should be angrily protesting. This is nonsense. We don't have to tolerate the Saudis living in the middle of the 8th of the century, the 9th century. And we, actually, we should be saying to them, we find this abhorrent. The Iranians have locked up a Washington Post reporter just to remind us that they have such contempt for the Obama administration that they are confident the Obama administration will keep talking to them no matter what they do. The Iranians probably were the people who were funding and training and equipping the uh, rebels who took over Yemen this week. And remember, Yemen was the example cited by the president in October of proof that his strategy was working. Now, we haven't heard from him since Yemen fell this week. But then he's busy. Uh, the Super Bowl is coming up. There are a number of other important things. You can't expect him to notice random countries being lost to the West. He goes one around we need to really have, uh -huh, there you go. I'm not here today to tell you that I have an answer. I have a, I have a direction. But the first part of that direction is to lay out for the American people the facts about the scale of the problem. When you see the number of Islamists around the world, when you see what they say, and I'm a historian, look, the general rule is, if somebody tells you that they are prepared to cut off your head unless you convert, and the other day, four teenage Christians had their heads cut off because they wouldn't convert. Now, I take that to be a sign that they probably mean they will cut off your head if you don't convert. Yeah, but I think the American people need to see the whole picture, and only once we have the whole picture out can we start talking about strategies. One of the strategies, frankly, is to drive them off the internet. And whatever it takes to drive them off the internet, we should do. And we should be very clear about that. And one of the strategies should be to insist that everybody who's getting money from people like the Saudis have to have it noted. When I see an expert on TV telling me the Saudi version of reality, and then you learn that they're a professor at a major American university or a major American think tank, but they're totally funded by the Saudis, we should all know that. Because it's absurd. 
The apologists for these people are all involved in total intellectual dishonesty, undermining and weakening the survival of the United States. In addition, we should make it very clear that we're not going to tolerate any kind of advocacy from here on out of Sharia. We're not going to tolerate any kind of advocacy of violence against the West. We're not going to tolerate any recruiting. We're not going to tolerate any fundraising. Right. And we're not going to tolerate people who leave this country in order to go fight somewhere else. And frankly, we should make it a condition of losing your passport and not being able to come back. <laughs> In the middle of the 1930s, as the British leadership showed total cowardice and were terrified of dealing head on with Adolf Hitler, one man actually read Mein Kampf. His name was Winston Churchill. And he said, you know, I think this guy actually means what he said. And he began giving speeches. And he was a very lonely voice. At one point, he was down to four members voting with him out of 635. But he said, the truth is so important. And finally, day by day, Hitler proved that Churchill was right and the entire elite was wrong. Now, I believe we are in that kind of environment. I believe our government lies to us every day about this. I believe our State Department lies about it. I think our intelligence community has been co-opted intellectually. I think our military is frightened to tell the truth. And I think starting with the Congress, we have to demand that we, the people, deserve to know the truth. And we, the people, deserve the right to defend our civilization. I've been deeply involved for many years. My dad was an infantryman for 27 years. I grew up in the Army. I believe that the number one obligation of a government is to protect its people. And if you don't do that, everything else is put at risk. Over the next year, you're going to be visited by many candidates. Those of you who are Iowans have been through this before. I just ask you to demand that every candidate who comes through here every day from now to the caucus has to answer what are they prepared to do to help defeat radical Islamists so that America and its allies can go into the future in freedom and in safety. And if you do that, by about the sixth or seventh visit, every one of them will have a pretty good answer because they'll be afraid to come back. <laughs> so you can play a major decisive role and getting America back on the right track. And with your help, I have no doubt that the American people will defeat those who would cut off our heads. We will defeat those who would force us into forcible conversion of religion. We will defeat those who have such contempt for us that they think they can send us videos and we will do nothing. Right. Thank you. Good luck. And God bless you.